So the first six chapters of Nehemiah is all about building the wall, right? Then we have chapters 7 through 10. The people come back to repopulate the city of Jerusalem. Um, There's that time of dedication, um, celebration. The people read the law. They ask Ezra to read the law. It's just like this really big revival, reformation that's happening um, as the people come back and they rededicate, they discover their identity again, and um, they begin to walk in it. And then, so that brings us up to um, chapter 11, which is actually, again, about repopulating the city. And so scholars debate whether that's kind of connected to the same repopulation as chapter 7. But anyway, um, the whole point, like I said, of this temple and wall building, the whole point of it um, is that the reforma- for the reformation of the people and the revival of the people of God. If we just remember for a minute that these people have been in exile, they're scattered a whole generation. So you forget who you are, right? I mean, I for- we forget who we are from week to week, I think, you know, but you think a whole generation. And so this is all about bringing back the people of God, bringing revival to their hearts and helping them remember who they are and, and re-educating them, really. Um, I love that because the holy city, the temple, and the wall was not built to just built to just be like a beautiful tourist attraction. We have to remember that God was making a people for His name way before the first temple or Solomon's temple was built, and He continues in this day to make a people for His name after this temple, this Nehemiah's temple, the second temple, has been destroyed in 70 AD. God is continuing. So it's just a reminder that it's all about people. And the temple was just used for a purpose, to draw people together. Um, I love, this is one of my favorite scriptures in First Peter um, 2, 9 through 10. It's, one of, it's our, actually our um, vision verse for our young adult life group. It says, but you are a chosen people. This is, this is Peter talking to us, new covenant believers. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people. I love that. Like you weren't a people. You weren't even a people. And I think this is what God is doing in Nehemiah. He's like drawing people. He's drawing his people back together saying, but you are a people. Maybe you didn't feel like a people. And he speaks that same thing over us. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but you have received mercy. It's good news, isn't it? So the temple is just a means to achieve a goal, and the goal of God is a people transformed to reflect his glory and beauty. And I think we can see that when we look at the European cathedrals. Those those were built with their, like, soaring um, arches and vaulted ceilings and stained glass. Those were all built not to be an ends, an end to themselves, but to point to the beauty and glory of God, right? And we... Um, and it's, so it's a shame that a lot of those cathedrals are empty in this day because they're, they're all, those are supposed to be filled with people, pointing people to the beauty and glory of God. And I think that the movement that we have been part of um, has swung so far to the other side that, yeah, it's not about the building. It's about the people of God that now we have what Nana calls like warehouse looking churches, right? We like have discounted. So there's got to be something, you know, the beauty and glory is good. The beauty and glory of the temple is a good thing as long as we remember that it's pointing to something greater, to our God. Okay, chapter 12 is about the dedication of the wall. I love this chapter because um, it's talking about the ceremony of thanksgiving. And so what they do, they're going to, they're going to, you know, bless the wall, dedicate the wall to God. And they call all the Levites in from all over the place. So it's like having a big, uh, a big conference, a big rally of worship leaders, right? The Levites are the worship leaders and they gather them all in so that they can form these two huge choirs. And they start at the Western side of the wall and they divide the choirs and they go all the way around the wall and meet at the Eastern side at the temple. I mean, I just, I've been trying to imagine that in my mind, like these huge, massive choirs singing praises to God and ending up at the temple together. Like, how beautiful. Okay, so that's basically um, chapter 12, the national identity restored. I love this um, quote that I read that says, walls don't just keep people out, but in ancient times they set boundaries and gave identity to a city and its people. And I think that that, that, 
they were having this identity crisis, like who are we? And God it sets up this, this, these boundaries for them to help restore their identity. God does that, I think, for us. Like our, who, knowing who we are, it just, I love this because we have to know who we are before we can actually bless other people, right? Or we're just operating out of this external something of trying to be good. But if we know we're beloved daughters of God, um, I think that the, his love flows out of us a whole lot easier. And he's just reminding his people, this is who you are. Because the plan is still on for Israel to bless the nations. But they're not in any condition to bless the nations. They have to remember who they are and be gathered back in. All right, that takes us to chapter 13. It's really an anticlimactic ending if you got through it. And you know this dude, Tobiah? That in your life, but like they just keep tearing you down, that's really what Tobiah is doing. He's just tearing down. And this guy that was opposed, completely opposed to the building, now one of the priests has cleared out some of the storerooms in the temple where the, where the provisions for the priest are supposed to be kept. And Tobiah, who didn't even want it all to be built, is like all cozied up in the rooms. Like he's, made, he's just made himself at home in the temple like, wait, go away. You know, it's just like, it's just constant. Um, so that's a real bummer. And then, um, you know, you see the priest, like, basically stealing from the temple to, to help his buddy Tobiah. Um, there's the whole intermarriage thing, which, you know, again, just like re- helping re-envision these people who they are. There was a real emphasis in um, national purity in Nehemiah that we know is not God's heart permanently. That that is a temporary thing to help them remember who they are. Um, And so Nehemiah leaves on a business trip of some sort. He comes back. There's all this intermarriage going on. And if you remember just a few chapters before, they've renewed the covenant with God. They signed their name. They made these big pledges and promises. We're not going to intermarry. We're going to keep the Sabbath. But they do intermarry. It doesn't take very long for this just like kind of decline, decline to happen. And then there's Sabbath breaking, and then there is the lovely verse in verse uh, 1325. Nehemiah just absolutely loses it. He starts beating people and pulling, ripping out their hair. You're like, wow, and that's the end of Nehemiah. <laughs> so I just think like we just like, wow. But you know what I, I love about this is that there's no heroes in the Bible. Even our Nehemiah, who we've loved, watching him lead and rally Israel together. Um, He's not the hero. God is always the hero of the story. And even I think like as we um, as we just you know kind of wrestle with our takeaway from this book to think that like whatever is done for the kingdom is never wasted. And so even though it's not like Nehemiah saves the day and now everything is grand, his um, legacy is going to live on and we're going to see that. So I want us to watch this um, video Maybe we need to. Will someone turn the lights off back there? Um, This is a video. I don't know if you guys have are familiar with the Bible Project, but this is really um, cool. They have illustrated all the books of the Bible, and so this is going to be super fast paced. It's going to cover Ezra and Nehemiah. So don't worry. You can go to YouTube and watch it again if you want to. So maybe just observe and um, and take it in. And um, I think it's going to give us a little, like, overview, again, of, of just this, what, what's going on in Ezra and Nehemiah. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah. In most modern Bibles, these books are separate, but that division happened long after it was written. It was originally a unified work written by a single author. The story is set after the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and its temple and took many of the people into exile. And this book picks up about 50 years later and tells the return of some Israelites to Jerusalem and then what happened when they rebuilt the city and their lives there. Specifically, the book focuses on three key leaders who led the rebuilding efforts. You have Zerubbabel, then Ezra, and then Nehemiah. And the book's design focuses on the efforts of each leader. Zerubbabel leads a large group of people back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Then about 60 years later, Ezra arrives in Jerusalem to teach the Torah and rebuild the community. And then he's followed by Nehemiah, who leads the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls. 
And these three stories are designed to be parallel. Each begins with the king of Persia prompted by God to send the leader to Jerusalem, and he offers resources and support. And then each leader encounters opposition in their efforts, which they then overcome, but in a way that leads to a strange anticlimax in each of the three parts. Let's back up and see how it fits together. So the story begins with a decree from Cyrus, the king of Persia, and he's moved by God to allow the exiles to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And the author says this fulfills a promise made by the prophet Jeremiah that the exiles would one day return to Jerusalem. Now, this fulfillment should trigger our hopes in the many other prophetic promises that exile was not the end of the story. We have hope for a future messianic king from the line of David. We have hope for a rebuilt temple where God's presence will dwell with his people. Hope for God's kingdom to come over all the nations and bring his blessing, just like he promised Abraham. And so it's with all these hopes in mind that we read on into the story of Zerubbabel. His name means planted in Babylon. He represents the generation born in Babylonian captivity, and he leads a wave of Israelites returning to Jerusalem. After they settle there, they rebuild the altar for offering sacrifices and later the temple itself. The foundation laying ceremony and then the temple's final dedication, these are key moments. The past stories of the tabernacle and temple's dedication should be in our minds. This is when the fiery cloud of God's presence is supposed to descend. He's dwelling with his people, and it doesn't happen. And so while some people are happy about this new temple, the elders who had seen the previous temple of Solomon, they cry out in grief. It is nothing like their glorious past or their hopes for the future. And it's right here that we get the first story of opposition, and it's very odd. So the grandchildren of the Israelites, who were not taken into exile, they had been living in Jerusalem all along, they come to offer help with the temple rebuilding. And Zerubbabel refuses. He says, you have no part in our temple. And this, of course, generates a conflict which Zerubbabel overcomes, but it's very strange because the prophets had envisioned that the tribes of Israel would all come together along with all of the nations to participate in the worship of the God of Israel when the kingdom finally comes. So this is an anticlimactic moment to say the least. In the next section, we zoom forward about 60 years and we're introduced to Ezra. He's a leader among the exiled Israelites in Babylon. And he's a Torah scholar and a teacher. And so he gets appointed by Artaxerxes, king of Persia, to lead another wave of people back to Jerusalem. And Ezra wants to bring about spiritual and social renewal among the people. Our hopes are high. And again, we come to another anticlimactic moment in the story. Ezra learns that many of the exiled Israelites that had come back, they had married non-exiles who had been living around Jerusalem. Some of them were non-Israelites, and almost certainly some of them were. Ezra then appeals to the commands of the Torah that Israel was supposed to be holy and separate from the ancient Canaanites. And he then says that the people living around Jerusalem are like the Canaanites. They're going to corrupt the exiles. So Ezra offers a prayer of repentance, and it's very heartfelt. But then he rallies all the leaders and enacts this divorce decree that says all these marriages should be annulled, the women and children sent away. And then the decree is only partially carried out. We're given a list of some of the men who divorced their wives. The story is very strange for a number of reasons. First of all, God never commanded Ezra to do any of this. It was the leaders of Jerusalem who led Ezra to make the decree. Second, the contemporary prophet Malachi, he did say that the exiles should care about purity, but he also said that God was opposed to divorce. And so the mixed results of the decree, this all fits into this pattern of a strange concluding anticlimax. Which leads us to the next section about Nehemiah. He's an Israelite official serving in the Persian government, and when he hears about the ruined state of Jerusalem's walls, he prays and then gets permission from the Persian king Artaxerxes to go and rebuild the walls. The king even gives him an armed escort and all these resources. So after arriving in Jerusalem, he begins the building project, and he too faces opposition from the people who had already been living around Jerusalem. Once again, we face a tension in the story. The contemporary prophet Zechariah said that the new Jerusalem of God's kingdom would be a city without walls, that God's presence would surround it, that people from all nations would come and join the covenant people. But Nehemiah seems to operate with the opposite vision. He informs the people surrounding Jerusalem that they have no part in Jerusalem. And this, of course, provokes them to hostility. And so while 
Nehemiah carries out his vision for the city with integrity and courage. They have to build the city with armed guards to protect them. We keep wondering, could this whole conflict have been handled differently? And this all leads to the conclusion of the book in two movements, first positive and then negative. Ezra and Nehemiah combine forces to bring about a spiritual renewal among the people. They gather all the exiles together for a festival. They read and teach the Torah to all the people for seven days. And then they celebrate the ancient Feast of Tabernacles to remember God's faithfulness from the Exodus and the wilderness journeys. Then they offer a confession of their sins. They vow themselves to renew the covenant, follow all the commands of the Torah. And they finish with a great celebration over the temple, the walls of Jerusalem, and we're thinking, this could be the turning point, but it's not. The book ends on a huge downer. Nehemiah tours around the city, and he finds that the people have not been fulfilling their covenant vows. So Zerubbabel's work is undone as he finds the temple being neglected and staffed by all these unqualified people. He then discovers that Ezra's work is being compromised. He finds everyone violating the Torah, people are working on the Sabbath, and even his own work on the walls is involved because people are setting up markets around the walls of Jerusalem and working on the Sabbath. So Nehemiah, he goes on a rampage. He's beating people up, he's pulling out their hair, and he's yelling, Obey the commands of the Torah. And his final words are a prayer that God would remember him, that at least he tried, and the book ends. I mean, it's very strange. But we've been prepared for it, right? These anticlimactic moments have been woven into the book's design intentionally. And so it raises the question, what on earth does this book contribute to the storyline of the Bible? Well, remember, the book started by raising our hopes in the prophetic promises about the Messiah, the temple, the kingdom of God, and then none of it happens. So even though Israel is now back in the land, their spiritual state seems unchanged from before the exile. And while Ezra and Nehemiah, they do their best, but their political and social reforms among the people don't address the core issues of their heart. So what the book is pointing out is the same need highlighted by the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel. What God's people need is a holistic transformation of their hearts if they're ever going to love and obey their God. And so the book ends on a downer, yes, but it forces you to keep reading on into the wisdom and prophetic books to find out what is God going to do to fulfill his great covenant promises. But for now, that's the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. So, you know, he kind of asks the question, so what is the contribution of Ezra and Nehemiah? Because you're like, yes, there's all this reformation happening, this revival, and then the people seem to be back in their same old sin. And so... um. The cool thing is, is like, as I said earlier, whatever we do that is kingdom building lasts forever. And I think that maybe one of be, is going to be one of my big takeaways is God calls us to obedience, not to know exactly how things are going to turn out. But um, what scholars say about Ezra and Nehemiah is that advances the biblical story by describing how the necessary reforms in Jerusalem were set in motion. So there were good reforms that were already set in motion which were later to serve as the basis for Judaism, out of which Jesus and the early church emerged. So, amen, right? So there is lasting value to the reforms that Nehemiah and Ezra um, did because it's, and you think like it's, this is the remnant of people that were scattered all over, that, that God has gathered back together, that will continue until the time of Jesus and beyond. So um, huge importance. That's good news. Um, I think a lot of times when we're doing what we feel like God has called us to do, it feels it can feel like two steps forward and one step back. So I hope this puts hope in us that God, even when we don't see the results that we would like to see, that God is is using what he's called us to do. Um, the, who the remnant is is um, a really big question in Nehemiah. They do a lot of um, checking of papers and things like that. They want it to be really pure. There's a lot in here about who's in and who's out, about intermarriage. Um, but again, we're just remembering that God is gathering up his shattered people that have been um, dispersed. And it's so good that what he's what they're doing is they're having to remember who they are. They're not just a new people group. They're attached to this ancient people group. And um, I think as New Testament believers, as uh, New Covenant believers, that 
it's so good for us. I'm so glad we've spent time in an Old Testament book to remember that this is our heritage also, that this is our identity also being carried on. Um, another scholar says of Nehemiah himself, that next slide, Jose. Um, whoops, is there another one in there? Never mind, you can take that one down. Um, another scholar says that Nehemiah's, um, his reforming zeal partnered by the educative thoroughness of Ezra, is that it? Okay, gave um, to post-exilic Israel a virility and clarity of faith which it never wholly lost. I love that. Just again, that, that um, there was lasting value in what Ezra and Nehemiah did. And um, God doesn't waste any of it. Nehemiah had the courage and boldness to lead his nation in revival and reform, um, regaining their devotion to the Lord. Even in his desperate prayers, his praises, his outbursts, all this passion and perseverance left an impact on Israel that continued. And so um, in the video we just watched, he talked about these anticlimactic moments and that really these, the contemporary prophets of the time, Zechariah was one of them, that was speaking prophetically into the people to keep on going, like keep building the temple, keep building the wall. And that's really what the book of Zechariah is about. And so I want to look at that for a second at Zechariah 2. Um, because he he referenced it, because here is this interesting vision that God has of Jerusalem without a wall. So I want to talk about that for a minute. Let's read this first. Zechariah says that he looked up, and there before me was a man with a measuring line in his hand. And I asked, where are you going? He answered to me, to measure Jerusalem, to find out how wide and how long it is. While the angel who was speaking to me was leaving, another angel came to meet him and said to him, Run, tell that young man, Jerusalem will be a city without walls because of the great number of people and animals in it. And I myself will be a wall of fire around it, declares the Lord, and I will be its glory within. Don't you love that? That God, so this, this vision is that there won't be any walls, that nations and people will be welcomed in, and that God will be the protection. He will be the ring of fire around it. And what this is not, this is like this tension um, of this um, near future and great future of prophecy. So there is, in, and even in contemporary prophecy, there's this like partial fulfillment, and then there's a greater fulfillment in the future. And this is one of those situations because Zechariah is speaking to these very people that we've been studying about. So here's this tension. God, I mean, Nehemiah hears from God, build a wall. And he's in complete obedience to God. And Zechariah, around the same time, is saying, no, there will be no wall around Jerusalem. So who's right? Did they, you know, did one of them get it wrong? Did one of them hear wrong? Or are they both right? And I love thinking about how God uses us right where we are in the time and history and culture right where we are. And that culture needed a wall, even though that's not God's ultimate plan. His ultimate plan is for Jerusalem to be a city without walls where all are welcome. And at the time, it was important for national purity, for the identity of the people to be, you know, do you have your papers? Oh, sorry, you don't have the right papers. You can't come in. But the that was God working with, God insists on working with people. You know, I just think that that's so fascinating, that he insists on working with the culture in the history at the time. We've seen him use the Persian emperors. You know, he just, he's right there working with people. He doesn't zap people. He doesn't zap Jerusalem into place. We, we want him to do that, don't we? Especially with our rebellious kids, right? Would you just zap them? It, God just, I think if that... Another just takeaway from Nehemiah is God's not a zapper. He is working, right? He's just working with what he has even to get someday there. And it makes me wonder, like, what is God doing among us? Because we know what he wants to come back. And he says, when all nations hear. And, you know, you're just like, could you just make it happen? But he's somehow using us in like waiting really, really patiently the same way that he was using them. And so ultimately we know that the new he- in the new heaven and the new earth, Jerusalem will have no walls that every nation, and even now under the new covenant, every nation is welcome. 
that God works within history and culture. So, so fascinating. Um, all right, let's go to the takeaways, and then I want to have time for you guys to get to share what some of your takeaways. So I think one of my first takeaways is just this incredible picture of partnering with God in this whole, in this whole book. Um, or what I would like to call it is obedience without demanding results. And what I mean by that is um, we see God's divine enabling of this wall being built, and we also see Nehemiah's human effort coming together. Um, and it's sort of like if people don't, don't do anything, the walls won't get built. And if God doesn't do anything, the walls won't get built. It's this togetherness. And sometimes I hear people say a lot of times like, oh, it's just all God. It's just all God. And I know what they're trying to say is like we can quit, you know, like trying to make things happen in our own human effort. But I really think the biblical story is God with people, which is just amazing because he could just do it, you know, and not use people. But he does use us. And, of course, we get ahead of him and try to do things in our own strength and our own effort all the time. But this, like, walking with God and partnering with him is just, I think, one of the most beautiful things about relationship with God, that he values people enough to use people. And I, we've seen that clearly in Nehemiah. Um, this, is, this encourages me to listen to God's leading and obey what I hear. Uh, we have a part to play in building the kingdom, every one of us. Yes, women? We all have a part to play in building the kingdom, in building up the church, um, in sharing the good news with our neighbors, in caring for the poor and oppressed. Like God gives us a part on the wall, right? To build with one hand and hold, you know, the enemy off with the other. Like he's calling us onto the wall. And if you're not already, if you don't feel empowered to get on the wall, then I, I pray that today, that God would give you that vision to get on the wall and, um, and partner with him. Kelly Minter has encouraged us all through the, her study guide to find our part and jump into the story because we're in the same story, the same story that Nehemiah is a part of. We're just in that same story to be part of God's purposes in the wo- world. Um, but here is the thing. Um, as we take our place on the wall, as we fight off the enemy and build the kingdom, we're called to build, but not to expect neat and tidy endings. Does that bother you? <laughs> we're called to build, but not to expect neat and tidy endings. And I would even say that we're called to not demand results. And I think that's where Nehemiah, you know, he all that passion he had um, to build and to obey. And man, this guy was a, a, a man of prayer. You know, it was, like, really good, like, everything until that very last chapter. And I think he just demanded results. You know, like, no, 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 no. I had all, like, this is all right. We got the wall and the dedication and the singers and the worship, you know, reforms. And you guys signed a covenant. And and then what, you know? And so then you beat people and pull out anyone's hair. I mean, anyone, you know, like, yeah, right? <laughs> you know, like, you're supposed to be doing the plan here and you're not doing the plan and you know and he just loses it and I mean those of us who have raised children and you're like no I no like I I did this thing we talk Gabriel and I talk about this all the time like we just thought if we just did everything right right but but there's people involved and sometimes we forget that our children are people they're their own people and you know and they get to and and plus there's no such thing as doing it right you know we just We just obey, and I I love thinking about, like, wherever our children are, our grown children, um, God sees what we sowed in. He sees, of course, he sees our pride and our idolatry, and he forgives that, but he sees our heart that cared and that tried and that, you know, that built, that built, and um, he's not going to waste any of that, any of it. All right, my second, so that was... um, partnering with God or obedience without demanding results is what I want to take away from this. When it looks like, wait, I obeyed and nothing happened, it doesn't matter. God calls us to obedience, and we just trust him with the results. All right, my second takeaway is that prayer and action go together. From the opening chapter of Nehemiah, we see this man in prayer and fasting on his knees. We see him in prayer. 
Um, he seeks God all the way through there. His, his prayers are woven all the way through the book. The longest prayer in the Old Testament is in the book of Nehemiah. Um, and he, the last verse of Nehemiah, he says, remember me with favor, oh my God. So just a man of prayer. And I think it's easy for us because we know he's a man of action. And I think it's easy for us to label people. We, we live in a stream of the church, which is so cool because we, we pay attention to our giftings, which is really awesome. But sometimes we pay attention to them so much that that becomes our label. Like those are the prayer people and these are the social justice people over here. And really we're just called to be children of God in this holistic way where we all pray and we all care about what's happening in the world, right? And we just, because that's who God is and that's who he's shaping us into. And so we see this just interwoven in Nehemiah's life that everything he does comes out of a place of prayer. Praise God. What a way to do ministry. What a way to do life. Like you would hate to think that people are out trying to do good in their own effort because it's supposed to be this like with God um, life that we're doing. Nehemiah seamlessly moves between reporting things he has done and reporting things of prayer um, to the point where one of the commentators said that in our Western thinking, we often think of prayer and action as two different things. And he said that probably um, for an Israelite, for an ancient Israelite, they read scripture out loud and they prayed out loud. So for them, it probably, it wasn't just something you did in your head. It was probably much more of the same action, like prayer and action all intertwined to the point where you don't even recognize the difference. Um, all right, my third and last takeaway is to expect conflict. Like, why does it surprise us all the time? Because it's, it's constant. I love that God recorded this for us in Nehemiah. We saw um, in one of our weeks, we, in week four, we looked at eight different oppositions that they faced just in the first six chapters. Everything from um, the displeasure of people, ridicule and mocking, intense anger, plotting fights and confusion. I mean, would, would you have quit by now? You know, I mean, really, murder threats? Like, this is getting really personal. Deception, false accusations, and false prophet- prophecy from a friend. And then there's been more since that. I just quit counting at that point. But I really... I really want God to do something new in me and quit being so surprised by opposition because it is part of, you know, we, that week we talked about how we long for the garden, but we live in a, in a time where we have to wear the armor and that's not the outfit we really would choose to wear, but that's the, that's where we are. And I think that awareness, like I'm not in the garden. I'm not, I long for it. I was built for it, and I'm going to be in it again someday. But in the meantime, I put my armor on and just, you know, I I think I kind of want to have a new, like, come on, conflict. Like, that's just, you know, bring it on. I, I want to be in that, you know, just like, this is what this life is about a lot of times, most of the time, and not be so caught off guard and so surprised by it. Okay, your turn. You want to just hear what are any and it really this is a completely open um, floor if you have a testimony if there's some part of Nehemiah that has really struck you or um, like I said just a takeaway so that we don't just leave it in this room Um, the floor is open so please please share anything that you want to and if you have a repeat of one of mine that's awesome it'll just underscore it so who wants to go first Um, I love their celebration that they were so intentional about that, just to praise God um, and actually take time out just to celebrate what he was doing in their midst. I feel like it's so important to do that. Um, And also just to remember, (laughs) just his faithfulness just gives us hope just for the present and also just for the future. And I also just love... um, repentance um, and that confession that they just don't confess their sins but they confess the character of God Um, yeah I need to confess his character more so that was such a good reminder (laughs) 
I want to jump off that um, confession thing. I that is not my favorite thing, and um, I sometimes I th- I think because I'm not confessing, I'm building up all this stuff that I should be confessing, and I could just be overwhelmed by the idea of confessing. But I liked how she uh, presented it about getting on God's page. And if I will just admit this, this has really helped me. If I will just admit and then confess who God is, then it, it's not such a big deal. And I don't feel like, okay, I'm just a sinner and I'm confessing all this stuff. That's not who I am. Um, but on the w- weaving it into when the people realized that after that big, long prayer, they said, please don't look at our suffering as trifling. We're st- we're in the land, but we're in slavery, and all of our harvest is going to the Persian kings. That coupled with confession, if I, when I realize that I'm not living in what God has for me to, to go after that, and confession is a, is a part that weaves into that, but they, they n- knew what God had for them, and they didn't have it. And so that's a, that's a new focus for me, too. And I really appreciated how they used what God had said in their prayer. This is, this is who you are. This is what you're doing. This is what we're asking for. So ag- agreeing with God what God has for us, and then going after what is missing in my life that he has for me. That's been, that's been really huge. Let me see if there's anything else here. Oh, I, after one of the chapters, I thought, why can't I see God the Father as the perfect parent? Because I've had to reparent myself after I've had children just to get an idea of how much God loves me by how much I love my children. And God is, every family gets their name from God, the Father. And he is just the perfect parent. And don't you love how when God speaks to you, it has just the right tone? He is never just snooty or uppity or... He doesn't make, he never makes me feel bad. He's just really amazing. So I am trying to get this picture in my mind of God as the perfect parent that I would just love to go to him. Just as I hope my children would love to come to me, you know, and so God is the perfect parent. Who's next? Uh, after this uh, Bible study, I take in two important things what I learned from Diane. And I want to tell you, thank you, Diane. You're always bringing God so close in my heart. And it is so wonderful to experience that way with somebody what you love so much and what you trust so much. And I have both of you, of that, and of God. I trust you, I love you, and I love God, and I trust him, and I love him. But two things what I want to bring uh, important after this study, it is, you know, most of the people know how I left the country, and this is my biggest pain. But actually, after this experience with a, with a story about Nehemiah and people who left the country, and uh, uh, start to make new life uh, actually make me to feel so good. It's not the end of the world. When you found the God, actually this is, can be so nice, uh, sweet, and, and wonderful. So I feel better about I lo- lost my <laughs> country. <laughs> it is not the end of the world. I found the God, <laughs> and that is most important. Yes. And second things... <laughs> 
And second things, I am girly girl. I love dresses. You can see all the time I, I wear the dresses. And my life is always like that garden with a hat and, and dresses. But somehow I start to love armor men because <laughs> life, it is, how you say, uh, full with uh, surprises, bad things, good things. So armor, we need to be an armor men. The, to being strong. So I love that guy also. So that is what I kind of have after this class. And I also want to tell, where is the lady? Was she say last time? Uh, I don't know her name. Uh, let me find her. Did she left? I think she left. Remember when the lady was she cried last time because uh, in our group mm -hmm. she thinking is Barbara? Barbara, yeah. Barbara, where is she? Oh, yeah. oh. She Barbara, I just want to tell you you look beautiful today. I like shiny shirt. <laughs> and, and when she say last time, uh, she thinking she's here and all another ladies is here mm -hmm. comparing to her. I think here it's place where nobody doesn't compare where we belong. We are here to celebrate God, and this is magic things. Uh, when we go in real life in the North Park Mall, you can think that way. But here <laughs> we are all definitely same, and uh, I pray for her, and today I saw her. She came with a shiny shirt. <laughs> I said, wow, God, he's amazing. She looked beautiful, and definitely she belongs on the same level like everybody here. Amen. Yes. I'll give it to you. Okay, it's not sharing things. It's the microphone that's intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, don't tell Andy you want to get me one of these <laughs> all the time. Um, okay, I, what's funny is I shared this at my table earlier because that was one of our... Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, goodness. Um, what's funny is... Uh, I answered this question earlier at our, it was at our table, but I think I'll answer it a little differently this time because there's probably so many things that I could take away, um, share a funnier one. Um, but uh, one time, it's funny how so many uh, things from this class would tie in with what God and other people are trying to teach me in other areas of my life. And uh, to the point that one day I was like, uh, me and my husband joke with each other all the time, and I was like, Andy... You paid Diane off, didn't you, this week? I know you did. <laughs> Jokingly, because it was something he had uh, told me that I needed to work on, and the very next day, is that was the topic that she was speaking on, and I was just like, oh, wow. And um, But then that's happened in, um, uh, in different areas. But uh, so I just want to say that I love seeing how, how God orchestrates everything and he connects everything uh, to help grow us. And, uh, and help us be prepared for uh, furthering the kingdom. Because in our eyes, we'll never be, uh, you know, completely prepared. But, uh, but he's always working on us and through us. Um, I just wanted to share a, kind of a vision. I appreciate one of your takeaways this morning was to expect conflict. That's my least favorite takeaway. <laughs> but I'm, it's so true. It's so good, and um, I think for me, I I think a takeaway from that is similar. It's, it's just expect struggle was kind of my takeaway, expect, expect struggle. And I was sharing with our table that I've always struggled with struggle. I just don't want to struggle. <laughs> I just, I don't want to expect it because that means somehow I'm going to accept the fact when it comes, and who wants to accept that? So I've really been asking the Lord a lot about struggle, and to just show me truth. And so I just wanted to share with you a vision that he gave me. Um, I'm, I'm new to visions. When I came to this church, um, people began to tell me they were listening and asking God about their dreams and visions, and that was foreign to me. And I've always been a really active dreamer, so I'm just kind of now getting into this and, and receiving from the Lord when he gives me a vision. 
So one night I woke up and he was, um, we were having a conversation really during the night. And I said, Lord, I, I really need a, a picture of struggle and, and, the, and why struggle and joy go together. I don't understand this. And so this, is, this will be more meaningful to me, I know, than y'all. But um, he gave me a vision of, uh, he, I, I have a habit at night of, before I go to bed, I put on lotion and I usually put on some sort of chapstick or something. Well, silly me, I'm always putting on the lotion first, and then when I get ready to pull the cap off the chapstick, I can't do it because I put on my lotion first. And so I'm like, why do I do this? I'm, I'm 55 years old. I should have this down by now. And so um, so I've, that's happened several times where or I'll get ready to open up a door, and I can't do it because I'm all lotioned up. And so he said, so this is the visual. He said, you know how you're always trying to open a door when your hands are all oiled up? And he said, well, you know, Dana, she's getting some credit here. Dana and I have talked a lot about the, the cup of suffering and the oil of joy. All right. And so I already had that going through my head. And he said, you know, when you get ready to open a door and you're all lotioned up with the oil, he said, you can't do it. You have to wipe it off. There has to be friction there. There has to be friction with your hand in order to open up this door. He says, sometimes there has to be struggle before you can open up a door of truth that I'm trying to tell you. And he said, I, that struggle has to be there. And when the struggle has occurred and that door of truth gets opened up, then you'll get to have that oil of joy. We'll, we'll, we'll oil you up. And, uh, and so I just wanted to share that with you because I thought that was a beautiful picture of the oil, I mean, of the struggle and the joy going together. So I'm trying to get there while I accept that struggle easier. And having that picture kind of helps me remember that God is often opening up a truth, that that's the only way we'll get it. Uh, if we have to have that friction there, it has to happen. So, My favorite takeaway is remembering each day that the joy of the Lord is my strength. Verses was right out of week one or week two. I don't know whatever reason I was at that time, and it has stayed with me. And it says, "Your love, your loyal love, consoles me, because you have promised that to your servant." And I that has just stayed with me. And so I love the book of Nehemiah. And thank you so much, Diane. I think the having a heart that breaks is, um, you know, and that heart of compassion is what has really spoken to me because I'm more comfortable with, I have a passion for truth and I'm mad. I'm mad about the lies that are being told, especially to our children. I'm mad about the world that they're growing up in. I'm mad about so many things and I'm really comfortable with mad you know, but the root of that is that I'm grieved and my heart breaks, you know, because I feel like so much is being stolen from our children and the, you know, God's children. And um, so this was a huge reminder to me to stay in touch with the fact that it is, it is the grief you know, that, that what I feel that, that I'm more comfortable expressing is anger or taking a political stance or, you know, stomping my foot and banging on the table, you know, is really this, this grieving. And, and to be sure that when I express it out in the world that I don't just come across as some, you know, another screaming head, you know, but that I, that I really allow my heart, my broken heart to be seen. Yay! That was really good. Thank you for sharing. Um, and I just want us to remember that we are strong, beautiful, loved women of God. We're strong. And out of that place, I love that Jan ended us on that note because I think like a heart of compassion is so, is so God's heart and so much more beautiful than whatever the take a stand for truth, you know, that because that will move us to care for people where I think the, the anger and taking a stand can just cause us to, you know, push back. So thank you for that.
pray for us. Father, thank you so much for this time together, for this group of women. Thank you for taking us on a journey, Lord. And Father, um, thank you just for these things that you have deposited in us and the way you've opened our eyes. And I just pray that you would seal those things in us, Lord, whether it's wearing the armor or having a heart of compassion. Um, Father, just seal those things in us. And I long for the new Jerusalem with no walls, God. We long for that, for your glorious city. Um, and God, we make us people that are um, sharing your good news with whoever you put in our path so that lots and lots and lots of people will be gathered um, in the new Jerusalem together. We love you, Lord. Amen.